It's time for ROTD Weekend. Back in the day, I was very dismayed the first time that I watched Pulp Fiction because I did not love it as much as every single other person I knew had loved it. And I think what had happened was the expectations had been raised very, very high. Everybody was raving about this movie and I finally got to see it and I was like, huh, that? Except maybe the Royale with cheese scene that is so classic and so good. But yeah, I did didn't like it and I didn't know why I just didn't like it. Then, you know, fast forward a few years and I was watching it again. And the thing was, is I remembered not liking it. I remembered thinking it wasn't a very good movie. And then I loved it. The second time I saw Pulp Fiction, I thought it was the greatest thing ever. And I think it was just because my expectations had been lowered so much by not liking it the first time. Now I really do love this movie. I mean, I haven't seen it in a long time, but you know, I I had this experience where my expectations were raised really high and then they were lowered really, really low. And then I was able to appreciate just how good this movie was, you know? So this happened again to me last night. Last night was my birthday. I'm recording this the day after my birthday. And Marty and I went to dinner last night to a wonderful restaurant. It is Ava Mediterranean. It is in Winter Park, Florida. So like Central Florida, right adjacent to Orlando. This is the restaurant. If you were listening a couple weeks ago when I talked to Rochelle Lucas from the travelbite.com, she said that this restaurant was probably one of her favorites in Orlando. And it really is fantastic. It is very vibey and like gorgeous looking Mediterranean inspired decor with like really dim but perfect lighting. The music is good. It has a dress code and people do get dressed up to go like swanky fancy. I'm never sure I fit in at all. I don't have that like supreme polish but whatever. It is a gorgeous place and the food is incredible. It's kind of tapas like but like the Greek version so it's like meze little portions of things that you you share a lot of bright flavors. There's dill and lemon and tahini, feta and tapenade, all those sorts of things, right? So last night we had, I'm actually bringing up the menu so I can tell you for sure what we had. So we had the dolmas, that's the grapevine leaves that are stuffed. These ones are stuffed with rice and pine nuts, lemon juice, fresh herbs, and there was Greek yogurt, really nice. Their spanakopita was pretty classic, but Marty had never had spanakopita before. I don't understand, but he liked it, so that was good. Oh, the potato milfoy, we get that every time we go there. We've been there three times now. This is like they take a potato and slice it as thinly as possible, like transparent slices probably, and then somehow smush them all together so they hold together, and then they're fried, and they are just the flakiest, crispiest, but soft in the middle things. I love them. They're served with an aioli. We had a grilled halloumi cheese. That one had Greek honey on it, sesame seeds. Oh, and they flambe it at the table, like set it on fire. It's a whole thing. Really fun. And we also had sea bream ceviche. This was probably Marty's favorite thing of the night. It had verju and a green tomato pico de gallo and this like crispy cracker bread that seemed like it had just been fried. Really nice. And we ended the night with a black truffle risotto. Now this black truffle risotto is my pulp fiction of food. So the first time that I had it was the first time that I was at the restaurant, maybe about a year and a half ago. And it was the most stunningly, beautifully delicious thing I've possibly ever had. It was this pearly white. It was very smooth and creamy, not stodgy at all, with all this shaved black truffle over top. I was in heaven. I have literally had dreams about this risotto. Like I have woken up tasting it. I have been eating it while I'm asleep. Like, I'm not kidding. This is really a thing that has happened. It was that good. But then we went back to that restaurant a few weeks later. We had friends visiting from New Orleans. And I was like, oh my God, we have to go to Ava. And you have got to try this risotto. It is insane. And of course, I built up the expectations of both my friends and my own expectations were built up. And I was very sad that it was nowhere near as good as my memory. It was a different color, a little bit beige. It had mushrooms on it as well as the shaved truffles. It was 
is not quite as silky, just not quite that like dream worthy dish that I had had, you know? And my friends definitely were not super impressed by it. I had done that Pulp Fiction thing. I had built it up way too high and they couldn't possibly like it. You know what I mean? But I'm happy to say that last night was delicious. So now I'm not entirely sure if it is actually as good as it was the first time because I have this like Pulp Fiction effect going on, right? So like, I didn't like it very much last time. And now this time it like way went above my expectations because of that. I'm not sure. But what I know is that it was extremely delicious and was a wonderful treat for my birthday. Absolutely. And I wholeheartedly recommend if you are going to be coming to the Orlando area, make a reservation at Ava. They're sometimes hard to get. They book up, especially on the weekend, so you definitely want to do that. And if you go, try that black truffle risotto, and then you've got to tell me what you think. And then I need to figure out if we have Pulp Fiction affected it or not, because I told you it was amazing, and then I told you it wasn't good, and then I told you it was really good. So I don't know what that's going to do to your expectations, and I want to find out. Now, speaking of restaurants, food, expectations, all of it, I have an exciting guest for you today. I am speaking with Laura Sherb from pageandplate.com. Laura recently had a piece in Stained Page News about why so many cookbooks have similar recipe lists these days to the point where you know what you're going to find when you open a cookbook and look at the index. And she is not happy about it. She has things to say. And so now I'm going to play you my conversation with Laura Sherb about why so many cookbooks have similar recipe lists and what should be done about it. Welcome to the show. Hey, Christine. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, I am super excited to talk with you because I really love this article that you've written in Stage Page News' Stained Page News Substack about the similarities you're seeing between cookbooks these days. Can you talk about what led you to write this and what you've been finding? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there was a meme going around the food internet a couple of months ago, and it was basically saying that every cool, hip, trendy restaurant sort of has the same menu these days. And when I saw that, I just happened to be flipping through my cookbooks at home. I have way too many cookbooks. It's almost embarrassing to tell you how many shelves are filled. And I started to notice that a lot of the very hip, like really good selling cookbooks that are out there have a recipe index that is nearly identical. Identical. And it is just wild to me that, you know, you could basically copy and paste some of these recipes from book to book. I'm a food photographer. And the reason that I first started noticing it was because like this recipe looks familiar to me. And then I would flip to another cookbook and see a photograph of nearly the exact same staging of the exact same food. And I just thought that was kind of weird. Because in cookbook publishing, obviously, there's so many factors that go into deciding what recipes are in included in a book. And I just thought it was sort of interesting that there weren't more editors, more readers who were demanding different recipes and more cookbook authors, chefs, recipe developers who were looking to put something different and new and wilder out into the world. Yeah, no, it, it's so super true. So I want to go back to what you were saying about the restaurants being the same, because I think that that is, it's sort of, it's a very similar thing. And I know in your article, you bring up burrata, which is uh, something that I love. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I first started seeing it on, so I had discovered it, a friend somewhere or something, and then first started seeing it on menus. And I was like, oh, I'm ordering this. I love this. I love this. And now it is to the point where <laughs> I'm like, I'm done, but it's everywhere. And so that same kind of trend is happening in the cookbooks. I'm assuming the restaurateurs are jumping on trends and it's because we like these things. Is it the same? Do you think it's the same with the cookbooks that these are the recipes that people actually want or is is it different? 
you know, I think that it comes down to perception with all of these expectations, both on the restaurateur parts and on the cookbook publishers, cookbook editors side. You know, I'm not really sure at the end of the day who is making the ultimate decision to include these recipes. Right. And I should say that, like, I love these restaurants. Right. Like, I'm totally guilty of going to them and ordering the same thing. Same Mm -hmm. with the cookbooks. Like, the reason I was able to come up with this thesis is because I myself have purchased so many of those cookbooks that contain the exact same recipe list. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think, you know, it's, it's, it's all about perception. People love to guess what people want. And when you see that people like yourself are coming into a restaurant and ordering burrata every time for their appetizer, which same, absolutely. Like, yes, I was ordering burrata every time I went Mm -hmm. out. They're going to continue putting that on the menu because it's risky financially to put something out there, to invest time and resources, to be cooking things that you're not sure if an audience is going to love and order and buy the cookbooks to make, right? Yeah. And with a cookbook, it's even tougher, right? Like as as a chef Mm -hmm. or a restaurant, you can try something on a menu and see if it works and pull it off. I mean, depending on what kind of restaurant and how your menus are produced and all of that. But you know what I mean? On a special Mm -hmm. with the cookbook, like you, it has to be decided. And then it's a year, months of time at developing, photographing, and then the investment to to market it as well. So you have to kind of rely... Well, that's the question, right? Do you have to rely on the standbys? I guess what that brings me to really is, and I'm sure you have thoughts on this, like what is the purpose of cookbooks for us these days? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, that can be such a different answer depending on who the cookbook writer is, who their audience is. And, you know, even the ethos behind the cookbook, like I think of a salt, fat, acid, heat, like Samin was just trying to get all of us to understand the basic building blocks of chemistry that affect the way that cooking happens. So of course, she needed a roast chicken recipe in that book to help explain how the enzymes in buttermilk break down the chicken. That's how it cooks and is so tender and wonderful, Mm -hmm. you know, great. But I I guess where I started to question it was like, does every TV personality turned cookbook author and, you know, ex chef now cookbook author and ex bon appetit personality need a recipe for roast chicken in their cookbook? And, you know, I think that sometimes if you're doing something radically different, like I said with Samin, or showing a new technique that is wild and unheard of, of course, there's a reason to include it. But if not, as a consumer of cookbooks, I would rather see you as a cookbook author using that page space to give me a recipe that is completely different, something wild, a technique I've never tried before, or an ingredient that I'm unfamiliar with. Like, I want to be challenged by the content that I'm getting in a cookbook. Do you want that for all cookbooks? I guess I don't cook from cookbooks very often. It it ends up being very complicated, right? As a recipe developer, as like I have cookbooks too, and like I'm developing recipes, I'm coming up with new things. I am the one who will, of course, try the brand new technique. I have done the buttermilk chicken. I'm not as huge a fan as the rest of the world, by the way, because the skin doesn't get very crispy. But that's, I'm all about the crispy skin. Yes, the chicken's very tender. But like I, of course, try these things. And I love those innovative techniques, but I don't cook from cookbooks. So I don't know what people who are actively cooking from cookbooks do. And I also don't know if everybody cooks from the cookbooks. I actually have a friend who has a very large cookbook collection and she just likes looking at them, an as- aspirational cookbook. And so... Yeah, I I guess I don't really know. Like, should every cookbook be innovative and and have all of these different techniques and things all the time? Or like, what do people actually want from them? Totally. I think personally, the answer is no, right? Like, think about how many people in your life you know who cook. I'm guessing that there's someone who can barely boil a pot of water. And there's someone who, you know, makes five course, completely intricate dinners for the most casual of occasions. And there needs to be a cookbook out there for everyone, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So of course, I'm not saying that everyone needs to be doing these cutting edge innovative techniques. I think that what I'm saying is I would like to be surprised more than I am when I'm flipping through the table of contents in a cookbook. Mm -hmm. And particularly with, I guess I would call it like that middle ground. If you're not writing a cookbook with basics for beginners, 
where you need to be explaining everything and showing these, you know, traditional techniques and taking them through step by step and holding their hand, or you're not writing like a sous vide, how to do molecular gastronomy cookbook, the middle ground needs to be shaken up a little bit, right? Like ask yourself, if you're putting together a table of contents for a cookbook, Mm -hmm. do you need to include your roast chicken recipe? Are you saying something different enough? Or could you put in something different there? Or just take it out all together, right? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where I'm coming from is like, I just feel like there are so many of these cookbooks with a similar table of contents that not every recipe can possibly be so exciting that it needs to be done again. It almost feels like uh, you're trying to prove something or you have to include it because it's expected of you type of thing. And that's where I think it's like the audience, the publishers, the writers, like everyone needs to get behind this idea. You know, why do we expect certain recipes to be included in these books? Yeah, I I guess I feel like so much depends on the concept behind the book. And then maybe Mm -hmm. people are trying to prove themselves or prove something or do something. I I don't want to put any motivations on people. But like, so if you're doing the 30 minute cookbook, then your roast chicken is going to somehow be ready in 30 minutes, probably gonna be spatchcocked or something, right? Like, uh, and, and like, and so it's this like, okay, here's the paradigm or the idea of my book. And then here, I'm going to show you how I can do the the chocolate chip cookies and the roast chicken and the braised haddock that everybody else is doing in that time Mm -hmm. or in that in that Mm -hmm. framework. And so then like that's I think that's sort of what I think is happening. And then it's like we're like gimmick based or something. Is is that Mm -hmm. the feeling that you have? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Or just, you know, like, like, I think a lot about why we include recipe titles that say the best, the ultimate, the only that you'll ever make again. What would a recipe have to be for you, Christine, that would make it the best or the only that you ever made again? Oh, yeah. No, I know. I I think about this all the time. There's a Venn diagram in my head of like the ease. And I don't, easy is different for people. The kind of easy that I like, it's my particular brand of easy Mm -hmm. and delicious and like family members like, and like there's a certain uses things I tend to have, not special ingredients. Like there's this Venn diagram. I will say, I don't know about in cookbook recipe titles if it works. But certainly like because my business is um, online recipes, having those things in the titles does make people click on them from like Google search results or something. Like if you search for cream of mushroom soup and there's my the best capital B-E-S-T cream of mushroom soup and it's got, you know, 55 star reviews, like you're more likely to click, click on that than the one that just says cream of mushroom soup. So I don't know if maybe it's that. But once you have the cookbook in front of you, There is only one roast chicken recipe in that cookbook and you've already bought the cookbook. So it doesn't need your clickbait best. So then I have no idea why those are there. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or just even the thought that it's like, like, you know, ultimate is another word that we use to sort of give a value. And, you know, there have been recipes that I've read through where the head note will say, this is the last recipe for rice you'll ever need in your life. And it's like, no, it's not. (laughs) <laughs> Unless you are giving me a technique that is going to like allow me to cook rice on the stovetop in five minutes instead of using the microwave, like whatever, it's not going to be the last end all be all rice recipe. You know, like there are recipes I love that I'm so loyal to. Like I have my focaccia recipe that I use. I'll try a new one, but I have the one that I'm mm-hmm. going to use. Mm-hmm but it didn't say best. It didn't say ultimate. And the reason it works for me might not be the reason it works for you. Yeah, no, it's it's so true. I think this is all about perspective, as you were saying before. But like, if you like the way somebody writes recipes, their roast chicken and their focaccia and their are possibly going to be the best for you, but they're not going to be the best for somebody else for sure. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And I think that this all really boils down to, uh, you know, what I've been saying, which is that we need to put an asterisk on all of this, because it comes down to knowing who your audience is and understanding where they're cooking from and what they want to be cooking. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, like you were saying before, the beginner books are going to be different from the, you know, if if you're buying a cook on, you know, Himalayan cuisine, I have no idea what I'm even saying right now. But if you're if you're buying that book, you have this other kind of interest than somebody who's getting the how to cook everything Mark Bittman book, which is, you know, they're very, very, very different, different books, right? right? So I know you've been doing some research into older cookbooks compared to what you're seeing today. I know you have some things to say about that. But I'm wondering, do those have a similarity in their indexes between them as well? Have you been noticing that? 
you know, to be honest with you, I haven't sat down and done the index comparison in part because cookbooks then I'm talking about like 70s, 60s. I cannot believe how many recipes they crammed into those cookbooks. I mean, you'll open a page and it's like the whole chapter for what we would see in a book today on one page. And that's because of just, you know, the different formatting. Back then, they weren't doing like a photo for every recipe. Mm -hmm. There were no such things as spreads. You know, it was a very pared down version of what we see today. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, 100%, there are standards that you notice when you flip through. And lots of them involve Jell-O. Oh, (laughs) it's so true. (laughs) Oh, that's great. (laughs) Okay, so what have you been noticing about older cookbooks? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the biggest thing that I've been noticing has really sort of catapulted me into this new obsessive area of writing recipes. And it's that they are written in such a pared down, sparse way compared to what we do today. And, you know, a lot of it is very contextual, right? You know, people were raised differently back then. Women specifically were the audience for a lot of these cookbooks. Mm -hmm. And there was an expectation that they had taken classes on, you know, how to cook. They were being coached by their mom. They were being, you know, helped out in the kitchen in some Mm -hmm. cases. So, you know, very, very different audience than today's cookbook reader. But there was so much more assumed knowledge. It feels like the cookbook author than the Better Homes and Gardens cookbook, for example, in 1962, they were writing to a smarter audience. It Mm -hmm. reads in comparison to some of the cookbooks Mm. that you read today. And it has really made me think a lot about how we read cookbooks, how we follow recipes, how we as consumers of these recipes kind of sit in the kitchen and take that recipe to create something. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. So I don't even know what to do with that, honestly, because yes, it's clear that they had shared knowledge and definitely shared knowledge, shared equipment, like the the sorts of the tools that you would have had. I mean, now you don't know if you're the person reading your cookbook has an air fryer, an instant pot, an oven, a convection oven, you know, nonstick skillet, cast iron skillet, like all the, the different possibilities. I, mm-hmm. I'm guessing that the equipment was pared down. And so you could assume that people had the same knowledge. They've all been, most people have been taught by their mom or they're taking uh, cooking classes in school. We had cooking classes in school. My kids do not. Um, And then the same equipment. So you could kind of go from there. And I guess the question is, like, now, do we have that shared experience? I don't think I mean, I don't think we all do. But like the person who buys a cookbook, do they? You know, I would love to see some data about who purchases a cookbook. And I'm sure that the key demographic there is so different depending on I mean, honestly, even publisher to publisher, right? Like, where are you distributing things? How are you pricing your cookbooks? How are you advertising them? All of those factors are going to wildly differ who your audience is at the end of the day. But I want to assume, which is always a fun and dangerous game to play, that if, if someone is buying a cookbook, there is a desire to be in the kitchen cooking something. So there is some kitchen space there is some sort of kitchen equipment or a desire to go out and purchase the kitchen equipment that Mm -hmm, is so often mm -hmm, listed out mm -hmm. in, you know, the what you need to cook these recipes section of a cookbook. And I I think that's probably the only two assumptions that we can make, you know, in terms of like familiarity or how people approach cooking. But I do, you know, I have to think, and I'm sure that you have thoughts on this as well, given your, your line of work. Do we assume that people understand that you use a spoon to mix things? Do we assume that people understand that if you're whisking something, you're using a whisk. You know, how how much are we really guiding people and over-instructing because of the standards that are in place? Yeah, no, totally. I'm thinking actually, so I knit. I don't knit very much anymore because I live in Florida, not in Canada anymore. Different knitting <laughs> clothing requirements, right? But like when you get a knitting pattern, it does not show you how to purl, stitch, skip a stitch. You Google, well, now I, I go on YouTube and I watch some woman, usually woman's hands showing me how to do this stitch, right? I don't learn it in the pattern. And yet we seem to be writing our recipes, cooking recipes, which I think are much more, like more people know the basics of cooking than know the basics of knitting, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And yet we're, we're just doing this totally dumbed down thing that I think... Does it waste time? Does it irk you because it's wasting our time or just because it's treating us like we're not very intelligent? What What is the issue really? 
So for me, it's because I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I write recipes. I have a newsletter and that's where I publish them now. Once upon a time, I had a food blog. I develop lots of recipes for clients as well for them to publish and send around. But, you know, I'm going back to like even before all of that, when I would have a recipe and I would give it to my mom. My mom is a great cook. She cooked for all of us growing up. Like we had delicious dinners. She knows how to cook, but she wants to know the exact measurements of seasonings which I never write down. (laughs) She wants to know, you know, like how long to bake it for to the minute. And those are things that I know that if I didn't give her the instructions, she would be able to figure out because again, she's a great cook. She has these skills. Mm -hmm. It's that she feels like she needs to know the answer to that because she's so used to reading recipes that say a teaspoon of salt or Mm -hmm. 25 minutes on the dot. So for me, I think the reason it bothers me is because if we, if I didn't give someone those instructions, I feel like they could figure it out anyway, and that would make them a better cook. So this kind of takes us back to our conversation about like, what is the purpose of writing down a recipe and sharing it? You know, mm-hmm. what is the purpose of a cookbook? I want to know that if someone uses my recipe, obviously they end up with something delicious at the end of the day, right? Like that's the first goal. But the second goal is just to have the confidence that they could recreate this recipe again And know this time that when they're making the hummus, they should add the salt at this part and not the other part, for Mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that makes so much sense, Laura. This is really fascinating. I have have a couple of questions. I just want to follow up, sort of go in a different direction. I'm curious what you think about like social media and things going viral and how that relates to this in terms of, so we were talking about restaurants and cookbooks having these same indexes and now we're seeing, you know, something goes viral and suddenly everybody's talking about cottage cheese and that's all we're doing. Like, (laughs) is is that, (laughs) is that? similar or is it making it worse or is it better because it pushes us every few days like I don't even know what to think about this gosh you know I don't either Christina I have worked for several you know CPG consumer packaged goods companies running their social media helping to do content creation in in former jobs and it is always really interesting to see how the virality of certain recipes affects what we're planning on doing and you know, that's just sort of, I again, I start to question, like, does our audience need our take on the feta pasta? Or like, are we okay to just not make more noise in a space for the sake of getting X more likes? And again, who's your audience? What's the purpose of your content? These are all important questions to consider. It's tough out there. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the social and I can't predict it. I did do a feta pasta. I will admit that on my site, but it was a no boil. You don't have to boil the pasta first. I tried to do like a take on it. That's kind of my my thing is is take the viral thing and do a take on it. But it does start to feel like we're all sheep somewhere doing, you know, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, I mean, you've already sort of alluded to this, but SEO, it's just, I think that it's a huge part of the problem. And it's so unfortunate because that's not something you can control. That's not something I can control. That is something that just like, that's the way the world is. That's how you get views and clicks and add dollars. You know, I've just, I'm connecting some dots here that, um, make me sad, I think maybe. So I know I realized very, very early in my blogging career that my recipes needed to have titles that people actually search for, because that is how I will have traffic coming to my website. People who are listening to the show may not know this, but this is a thing. So you don't do a recipe for spaghetti with pine nuts, shiitake mushrooms, and pesto and call it that because nobody is searching for that set of words you do Mm -hmm. you know maybe mushroom pasta or like something that people might actually be searching for and so that's definitely like something I'm well aware of is that it limits creativity in a certain way because you have to do these certain recipes that people are actually actively searching for but then that means that there's not space to do those other recipes and now I'm wondering if that has affected the cookbook index, like if, if it is the case that those the people writing the cookbooks are people like me who have this industry experience and are trying to do things for search engines, are we then doing the same thing in our cookbook list? Is that is that possibly what's happening? 
I'm sure, yes, right? I mean, I have to assume that that plays a part of it. And, you know, I even think about, you know, when I'm reading about a new cookbook that I'm considering buying, I will Google Alice and Roman newest cookbook, pineapple upside down cake or whatever to see if that recipe is going to show up in the index. So Mm -hmm. I'm sure all of this is super connected. And I would love to like zoom back in time and talk to someone in the 80s and 90s or 90s who was in the cookbook publishing industry and get a feel for what the vibes were there for how mm-hmm. to compile recipes. But yeah, it it I do I agree with you. Probably everyone who's not a content creator in this industry has no idea what we're talking about right now, but the SEO things, I mean that's part of why I stopped doing my food blog to be honest with you. It just was so constraining. I felt like I had no freedom anymore to write the mm-hmm. recipes I wanted to write and instead I just had to be, you know, doing the pumpkin spice stuff in October mm-hmm. and it, it just like all the joy was gone. All the spontaneity was gone. And when I think about cooking, like that's exactly how I feel the same way. Like sometimes I don't want to follow a recipe because that takes the joy and spontaneity out of it. So that's what I want for people when they're reading a recipe is just to feel like they have enough flexibility and freedom to take it and run with it and not Mm -hmm. have this rigid set of instructions that they fit into. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you. This is really fascinating, Laura. Thank you so much for bringing this up with us and writing the article and making me think about this stuff and sharing it with everybody else. I think it's really, really interesting. Can you let people know where they can find you and learn more about what you're working on? Absolutely. So I have a Substack. That's where I put all of my um, aggressive thoughts about food, wine, books, etc. So that's page and plate, uh, dot substack dot com. And then I'm actually like my full time job is a food photographer and stylist. So if you want to see that work, you can follow me on Instagram at page and plate studio, or you can go to page and plate dot com. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I don't know about you, but I am excited to see if what Laura has been noticing and what she said has any impact on the cookbooks that we see showing up in the stores. You never really know what's going to influence these trends and make things different, shake things up, and it might just be this. Now, if you want to see more of what Laura is doing, don't forget, go and check her out at pageandplate.com and subscribe to her Substack. So what is going on in my kitchen this week? Well, I want to give you an update because I was telling you about my ham gravy problems last week. I have perfected the ham gravy and oh my God, I don't usually serve gravy with ham, but I am going to every single time from now on. This stuff is the jam. It is so good. I cannot wait to tell you more about it, but I wanted to update you because I know I was telling you I was having trouble perfecting that recipe last week. I've got it. It is so good. Then this week, what I I'm up to. So I'm actually playing around with a Velveeta mac and cheese. This is sort of a weird thing that happened. I use Velveeta in my pierogi filling, the mashed potato cheese, and then there's some Velveeta in there for creaminess. This is a tip I got from my mom. And you know, if I learned it from my mom, it is definitely good. So I had some Velveeta in the fridge from making some pierogies. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to make some quick mac and cheese with this. And so I was Googling for like just a quick recipe, like how do you make Velveeta? Velveeta mac and cheese. And it was super weird because so many of the recipes involve making like a full roux milk sauce, like bechamel sauce, and then melting the Velveeta into it. And I'm like, I think that defeats the purpose. Like that is what I would do if I have like shredded cheese, a block of cheddar that I want to turn into mac and cheese. That's not what I want to do if I've got this already melty, dreamy, processed Velveeta stuff, right? And so of course, now this week, I am working on making a Velveeta mac and cheese that involves at most two ingredients, maybe some seasoning. I want it to be the pasta and the cheese, and I want it to work. So that is what I'm doing this week. I'm also working on a garlic butter chicken recipe that I'm super excited about, and a yellow squash casserole. Just a really nice side dish. These days, yellow squash and zucchini are in the grocery store all year, and they're really good. All year, it's one of those vegetables that just, see, I'm sure it's coming from all different places, but it just seems to always be of reasonable quality.
quality, unlike some things that are not as good at some times of year than the other, you know. So I want to have a nice back pocket side dish casserole potluck thing that uses yellow squash and or zucchini. And so I'm working on that this week as well. I cannot wait to update you on those things. As to what is going live on the site, I have the big pork tenderloin brine test. We tested wet versus dry and all the timings. That is going live on Cook the Story on Monday, but I don't want to confuse you. Tomorrow on this show, I'm talking about brining pork loin. That is different from pork tenderloin. Those are two separate things on the site. I know it's a little bit confusing, but you know, pork tenderloin are those long, skinny things. Pork loin is more of a chunkier roast, right? Okay, so that is what's going on there. And also this week is a easy homemade sausage gravy. I know I told you about the bacon gravy that is going up on the site in October. We tested that last week or the week before, but the sausage gravy is going up this week. And on this show on recipe of the day, you have a lot of amazing things coming your way. Like I said, the brined pork loin, how to do a perfectly brined pork loin that makes it juicy, tender, and well seasoned. That is there. I'm telling you about a bunch of different ways to make scrambled eggs. It's one episode of this show where I'm going over a few different ways to make scrambled eggs, and I've done a comparison and did a whole taste test with a bunch of people to see which way was best. So if you love scrambled eggs, that's going to be a great one. We are doing ranch chicken thighs, and we have some soupy stuff coming because I am excited to tell you that Zoop Good Real Good is again a sponsor of this show, and so I'm going to be telling you a little bit more about them this week, and I'm going to be trying to work some soups and broths and things into the recipes that I tell you about to go with that. So there are going to be some comforting fall soupy things in our future this week for sure. So that is the show for today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Laura Sherb, for being such an amazing guest. Don't forget to go check her out, pageandplate.com. And a reminder, if you like this podcast, if you like this cooking community that we are creating, make sure you join the Facebook group. It's at facebook.com slash groups slash recipe OTD. I look forward to seeing you there. And if you have not yet subscribed to this show, or if you just want to see all the recipes that I've talked about, all the guests that I've had on, there is one great place where you could do all that. You can subscribe and you can get to all of the episodes at cookthestory.com slash ROTD. I am Christine Pittman from cookthestory.com, thecookville.com, the all new chicken cookbook, and from this podcast, Recipe of the Day. I hope you have an amazing weekend. Let's get cooking.